launching them out into this new ministry, okay? Father, we thank you, Lord, for Matt and for Crystal and the call that you have placed on their life, the giftings that you have given each of them for this time. Pray, Lord, that as Matt begins to share uh, this vision, this calling with, uh, with parents, with co-teachers, with the students, especially themselves, Lord, that there would just be a holy anticipation of what's going to take place and that students would be drawn to this after-school Bible study that maybe have never heard of you before and, and don't even really understand what they're getting into, and that's okay. Or that, that there would be, regardless of whether it is two or 40, or maybe every single student, fourth, fifth, and sixth, Lord, however, whoever you would have to be a part of this, we pray your anointing upon Matt and Crystal as they lead. Bless them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to do amazing things for your glory. It's in and for your name that I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may have a seat. And uh, I trust that the amens mean yes, and we will continue to pray. All right. If you have any more questions about Youth for Truth and what they're going to be doing, you can, I, I'm sure Matt would be happy to share with you or Crystal would be happy to share with you. Uh, you can see either one of them or myself if you want to give the donation or if you just want to drop it in the offering plate and just make sure that you mark Youth for Truth uh, so that we make sure that that money gets put towards a sponsorship program, uh, that would be great, okay? A couple of other quick announcements before we jump in. Praying, talking about praying for our schools and all of that tonight at 6 o'clock. We're going to meet at the park, Kingston Park, uh, where we're going to have the block party. I'll talk about it in just a moment. We're, we're going to meet there. We'll go to the elementary school and pray. We want to pray for our students, the staff, the administration, all that, uh, that have a, a place uh, at Kingston Elementary. But then we also want to pray for the block party at the park and then play, pray for those that are at the high school. Again, staff and students as well as our school board. And so uh, if you're available tonight, I'd love to have you join us at 6 o'clock. Uh, some of us will walk, but if you're not able to walk, uh, especially I understand the, it's a little bit of a long distance and I was sharing with somebody, it is uphill both ways. <laughs> and, and the hill to the elementary school, it's not huge, but it's decent, especially, you know, depending on how your knees and ankles and all of that are. Um, so if you want to drive, if you want to just meet us at the park, That'd be awesome, and then drive up to the elementary school. We would love to have you join us. We want to make sure that you're comfortable and able to do that, um, but we'll just gather right out front at both schools uh, near their flagpoles and, and pray that God would bless our students. Uh, Kingston starts tomorrow, first day of school, so be in prayer for students and staff, uh, whether you join us tonight or not. Also, uh, quick announcement, if you don't attend, if King, um, Kingston schools, but you're in school, see me after service. All of the Kingston students are getting something tomorrow. Some of the staff already got something. Uh, I had somebody stop me on my, my morning jog the other day and say, they're yelling out the door, thank you! And I'm like, I have my earphones and I have no idea what you're saying. I'm like, what? Thanks for the blizzard. Oh, you're welcome. All right. Um, so they're getting theirs tomorrow, but we love all students, not just those that go to Kingston, okay? So if you don't go to Kingston, but you're in school, see me after service. Got something for you, all right? Last announcement, then we'll move on, because I'm ready to preach. We got, I got, mm. everybody should have had seen one of these when you sat down uh, this morning. Block party coming up uh, September 9th. Thank you to those that have already signed up to bring in items, those that have already signed up to volunteer. We still have some more slots available for both food items that we would like to have brought in so that we can help offset the expenses of this activity. But again, the, the biggest need is volunteers to, so that we can make sure that we provide as safe of a, a time and as great of a time as we would like. And so if you're available September 9th, we've got two different time slots, two-hour time slots each that you can sign up for, and uh, just our way of saying thanks for helping to love where we live. You will get a Love Where You Live t-shirt for volunteering and coming and working those two hours, okay? Questions on the block party, see me after service. I would love to answer any of those questions. Now, grab your Bibles and turn to the book of... Turn to the book of... 
John. How many of you are like, my book just falls open to the book of John. We've been in it for like nine months now. Um, here's, here's the deal. We finish next Sunday, Lord willing. All right. And then we're going to jump into the book of First John and talk about revolution. First John, or John <laughs> chapter 19, page 768, if you're grabbing a KWC Bible, uh, love to have you there in front of it, whether it's, it's a, a hardback, softback, leatherback, or a, a digital. Love for you to be able to engage God's Word as I read this morning. Love for you to be able to, to follow along. We're going to take a look at an incredibly, incredibly dark day. Some, many have said that it was the darkest day in history. And, and I think you could say that both literally speaking, as we, see, as we read through, we'll see that the sky literally went dark this day. But if you think of Jesus Christ hanging on the cross dying a sinner's death when he himself had sinned not. That's pretty dark. But it's also and more famously known as Good Friday. And so we'll look at all of that today as we look at John chapter 19. And we've been looking at this day actually already the last two weeks We've discussed things that happened on this day. But it's all coming to this point. All of that happened to lead up to this. Everybody say this. What I want us to see today is this happened. This happened. And there's three things that John, I believe, really wants us to see. More importantly, three things that the Holy Spirit wants us to see as we read through our text today. Beginning in John chapter 19, verse 17. I'm going to pick up a little bit of verse 16 because of just the way they split it up here. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Verse 22, Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. I'm going to just pause here quickly. We looked at it last week and we looked at Pilate examining Jesus and he had five different questions for Jesus. Great questions. And one of those questions is, are you the king? And Jesus answered the question. Now, I don't know if Pilate was absolutely convinced of the fact that Jesus was the king of the Jews, and that's why he had it written as Jesus, king of the Jews, or if Pilate was making more of a political statement and a kind of a power grab saying, here, we're crucifying the king of the Jews. But Pilate says, I'm sticking to my guns. I'm calling him the king of the Jews, and we're not changing that. And whether Pilate realized this or not, and this is what we talked about last week, Jesus is the king. And he's not just the king of the Jews, he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, right? Verse 23, when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the Scripture might be fulfilled, which said, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. This happened. There's something that I want you to see here. 
from, <laughs> super importance to learn from this day. God knows the end from the beginning. John has been pointing out throughout his gospel account, as it was written, according to the Scriptures. He does so here in chapter 19. We actually saw it last week, and he's going to say things again, pointing out, helping the reader, helping us to see that God knows the end from the beginning. It is so refreshing, so encouraging to me to know that God never gets surprised. God never has to use the emoji that sometimes we have to use when we're texting a friend, like the, you know, or like the, like, I don't know what to do. I wasn't expecting that. Or like, what? No way. What are we going to do now? God, God never, never faces that. And maybe you don't like that. Maybe you want God to be in the same boat that you find yourself in sometimes. Not knowing what to do. Not knowing what's going to come next. How things are going to work out. If they're going to work out. But I find great comfort knowing that God knows the beginning, knows the end from the beginning. That He, he already knows. He already knows. And there's over 60 prophecies, major prophecies about Jesus, about his birth, his life, and especially about his death and his resurrection. Many of them are found in the book that we've been studying and that we're reading through in the Life Journal. If you're not doing the Life Journal, I would encourage you to go ahead and start. And some of you say, well, but you're in the book of Isaiah. And I'm like, that, that might be a little bit hard. It might be a little bit hard. But there's help out there. And we cover things every Wednesday night, and I'll share a little lesson on Wednesday night, face, Facebook, with our um, life group live to help understand and to apply what uh, some of the different things that were shared in the reading from the previous week. And if you ever have a question about God's Word, please don't hesitate to, to ask me or ask someone else that you believe, that you trust, that uh, they've been in the Word. And here's my promise to you. If, if I don't know the answer, I'm not going to blow smoke. Okay. If I don't know the answer, I'll tell you I don't know the answer. I'll get back with you. I'm not going to leave you hanging for too long. I'll go look it up. I'll do some research. I'll ask some people that are smarter than me, whatever I need to do to find you an answer to, to help you to understand God's word. But in the book of Isaiah, there are a lot of prophecies about the birth, the life, the death of Jesus. That's why the book of Isaiah has also been called the fifth gospel. Because it's so much about Jesus. In fact, Isaiah chapter 46 verse 10 says this. God is speaking through Isaiah the prophet. He says, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. Hmm. If we could just grasp this truth, friends, if we could just be reminded that no matter what the circumstances, that God knows the end from the beginning. He says, I make known the end from the beginning. I'm telling you ahead of time so that you understand, so that you see things. We see earlier in the book of Isaiah, a sign has been given unto you. Uh, that a virgin will give birth and they will name him Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. I'm telling you this ahead of time. I've got plans. It's going to happen. And we read now in John chapter 19, and John's helping us to, to fill in some blanks and to connect some dots and saying, God knows the end from the beginning. He said it 500, 700 years ago, and it's come to fruition in this moment what great assurance great encouragement that i find knowing that C keep in mind jesus should have never had to have gone before pilate w one he hadn't done anything wrong two the charges that were being levied against him that of blasphemy of the name of god 
had nothing to do with Roman law. Nothing to do with Roman law. Jesus should have never have had to face Pilate, but yet he faced Pilate, and Pilate is having him beaten and ends up having him crucified, and there are soldiers that are taking his clothes, dividing his clothes. Hey, I, I want this, and I want that. Hey, you know what? We're not going to cut this piece. We're not going to like, you get a piece, and I get a piece, and you get a piece. This one, this one goes to one person. And all of that happened. Why? Because God said it would happen. Because God said it would happen. This happened because God said it would happen. And what a reminder, what an encouragement to know that God knows the end from the beginning. Verse 25. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to his disciple, here is your mother. From this time on, this disciple took her into his home. Pretty much every scholar that I've ever read from or listened to would tell you that the one, the disciple that he's speaking of is John himself. This is his MO. This is how... He's talked about himself throughout. He's talked about himself from the third person, right? He doesn't say, then I. He talks about the one, that, the disciple that Jesus loved. Or he'll use some other kind of language, but there's this understanding, I'm talking about me here. What I want us to see, just real quickly, just, just a pause and to see that while Jesus was on the cross, he was thinking of others. Isn't that just like Jesus? While Jesus is on the cross, he's thinking of his mother. She's watching her son die a horrible death. I mean, to to know that your child is dying is hard enough. But to watch them suffer, unimaginable, right? He's saying, woman, here's, here's your son. Here's somebody that that I want you to treat like a son. And, and, and it, John, here's your mother. Take after, take after her like, like I would. Take care of her. Watch out for her. What, what a special, intimate moment that we're given a glimpse into. And, and I just love that. I, I'm not going to preach anymore or share anymore. That's not the big, big idea that I want to share with you. But just wow. That while he's on the cross... He's thinking of others, just like Jesus, right, to do that? Verse 28, later, everybody say later. Later. Now, that's it. Some just kind of like, it's just a, it's a throw-in word, right? Like, meanwhile, back at the ranch, but later, I want you to think about it. Later means Jesus is hanging on the cross later. If you're going to die, there's two things. Pretty much guarantee that every single one of you want to happen when you die. Number one, you want it to be pain free. Number two, you want it to be quick. You want it to be fast. You want it to be over with, right? That's why, well, like, well, they died peacefully, and like we take comfort in that. Well, she didn't have to suffer long, and we take comfort in that. Later reminds us. Jesus didn't die painlessly. And he didn't die quickly. He suffered. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scriptures would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. So again, Jesus is fulfilling prophecy. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. There's some words that jump out to me. That everything was completed. And then it is finished. There's just something about 
being done with something, right? Not, not, not almost done, not that this almost happened, but this happened. How many of you, like, have a hard time finishing things? You start something, but you have a hard time finishing. How many of you have something that's unfinished? You have an unfinished business at home, and no, your wife didn't pay me to, to bring it up. Like, there's unfinished business. Like, you started something five years ago. Like, hey, I got this project. And, and, and some of you longer than that, some of you, well, it hasn't been five years. Give me a break. I hear the rumblings. Jesus completed it. He finished it. There, there's something about completion, not, not almost completed. There are some uh, fans, football fans, that were pretty distraught because they heard some news of something that almost happened a couple years ago. The Las Vegas Raiders almost got Tom Brady and Rob Gronkowski almost had the GOAT. But did they? That didn't happen. Instead, he went down to Tampa Bay. His, he took his talents south and, and won a Super Bowl with them, right? Raider fans, it almost happened, but I can't say this happened. Nope. You continued in your losing ways. Not to rub it in. Almost happened. Second thing I want us to see here. Jesus finishes what he starts. Jesus finishes what he starts. Why don't we finish the things that we start? Well, we, we, get, we get distracted, right? How many of you get distracted? We get discouraged. We get discombobulated. Like, what does that mean? Exactly. We, we forget. We get confused. All kinds of different things that, that come into play, we, we just, we get defeated, and so we don't finish. Jesus finishes what he starts. Philippians 1.6 says this, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He's faithful. He starts it, he does what? He finishes. He finishes what he starts. Hebrews 12, 2, which happened to be um, one of the memory verses that, are, are, that we had for VBX this year. And some of our students will remember these words. Let us keep looking to Jesus. He is the one who started this journey of faith, and he is the one who completes this journey of faith. Here's what I prayed for you this week. I pray that you would be filled with the assurance that Jesus finishes what he starts. And I pray that you would humbly, passionately, and faithfully commit to partnering with Christ to take next steps with him. It's so much better, church, when we work with him. When we intentionally seek ways to grow with him, to follow him to join him in the work that he wants to do in us. So Paul says, keep, or the Hebrew writer says, keep looking to him. As I look at these three words, it is finished. I, I've taught on this before, and some of you have heard it, actually some of you have heard it more than once, because some of you not only were here for the Sunday that I taught on it, you were here for the Good Friday service that I also taught on it. But just very quickly, so maybe it's, maybe it's follow-up, a reminder for some of you, and for some of you this is going to be fresh. But in the Greek language, the Greeks, the, their vocabulary was so rich. They looked to put as much stuff, if you will, into one word so that one word would carry so much meaning and, and could be used in a, in a lot of different ways and convey a lot of different images. And so what we have as three words, it is finished, they had as one word, tetelestai. It's in, there in your notes. Everybody say tetelestai. That's just a pretty fun word to, to say. 
tetelestai. And so instead of taking three words to say something that they could say in one word and give this great image, they just had the one word where we tend to take something that could be said in one word and use a lot of words and just have a word salad, right? And, and just like kind of confusing and everything else. But tetelestai, very quickly, very quickly, he had three specific ways that it could be used, all of which fit Jesus on the cross. Number one, tetelestai could be used when a servant came back to the master had been given a task, and he had completed. And so he comes back to the master and says, Tetelestai, I've completed the task, in other words. It's finished. And no doubt, as we see in the book of Isaiah and other places, Jesus was known as the servant. Isaiah calls him the suffering servant. Jesus, as we've seen throughout the book of John, talks about how he was obedient to the Father. He did everything the Father told him to do. And so he was on a mission. He was given a task. And, and so there's no doubt that Jesus could have used Tetelestai speaking to the Father saying, Dad, I've done it all. I've, I've done everything. Everything you called me, you sent me to do. Second way the Tetelestai would have been used was a merchant. When somebody owed a debt and the debt was paid in full, they would often write or have a stamp, Tetelestai, paid in full, the debt is canceled. You don't owe anything else. And there is no doubt that as Jesus hangs on the cross and he's taking his final breaths that he could shout out with triumph, Tetelestai, paid in full. And what an encouragement. What an encouragement to know that the debt that we paid, that we owed we, and we could not pay, was paid by the one who didn't owe the debt but could pay it because of his sinless imperfection. Here's his sinless perfection, which takes me to the third way that the word tetelestai would have been used. And the third way that the word tetelestai would have been used was by the priest the one who was tasked with examining the sacrificial lambs that were brought in and would take a look at the lamb and after examining the lamb, if it met the standards to be used as a sacrifice, would hold up the lamb and say and declare, Tetelestai. In other words, it is worthy, it is perfect, it is unblemished and certainly the same could be said for Jesus and be said from Jesus tetelestai the lamb the spotless lamb the sinless lamb who takes away the sin of the world as John had told us earlier in our study three different ways all reminders that Jesus finishes what he starts this happened. This happened. It, it's not this almost happened. It happened. Let's keep reading. Pick it up with verse 31. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and took and and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Verse 34. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus aside with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. It's rather graphic, isn't it? Verse 35, the man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. Again, we know that this is John. This is the way John talks about himself. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. 
You think just as John is writing this and he's watched his best friend, his, his Savior, and he's recording these words, he's, he's reflecting on this event. He's like, <laughs> I know this was true. I saw with my own eyes. I can't get that image out of my head. I can't forget what I saw. That blood and that water coming out, knowing that Jesus was, was gone. Like, <laughs> I know this is true. And he writes as somebody that knew it was true because he had lived it. It's interesting to me, and scholars have pointed out, that the blood and water that f- came from Jesus, as graphic and as disturbing as it is in context, has become a beautiful picture. Both of those are used for life, that we're washed by the blood of the Lamb, right? That we're made clean, we're made holy because of His blood that was shed for us. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. And so what is graphic and disgusting actually becomes something beautiful. And that's why when we sing songs about the blood of Christ, we don't sing them as like mosh pit and, and uh, heavy metal or whatever, like, rah, 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 like there's just something beautiful about the blood of Jesus, right? Because we understand that it, that blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins and we understand water and the cleansing power of that water. And water is an image that Jesus used multiple times about living water flowing from within them if they would trust in him. And we have a very visual image of both blood and water here. Verse 36, these things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Arimathea Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jews, with Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. We talked about Nick at night many chapters ago. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen, This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. I want to just quickly take your attention back to verse 35, 36, and 37. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happened. This happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. John wants us, I think, to just sit in this. to to be marked by this, to be wrecked by this. Why? Why is it so important? Why does John point out this testimony, the importance that Jesus is dead? Why? Because without his death, there is no life. Without Jesus' death, there is no life. It's so important that we let the gravity of the moment, Jesus' death, not just Jesus dying, but Jesus' death sink in. Throughout the book of John, John has been writing and showing things, pulling out different events, different things that Jesus said, throughout his three years of earthly ministry, 
to help every reader know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is and was the Son of God. John's very clear that that's one of his desires in writing the gospel according to John. Throughout the book of John, we also see that John is presenting and helping us to see the humanity of Jesus. Not only that Jesus was the Son of God, but that Jesus was the Son of Man. And so we see throughout the gospel account, especially as we've studied the book of John, we see that Jesus experienced things just like you and I experience. Everything that you and I experience except for sin, Jesus experienced. Jesus knew what it was to be hungry. Some of you are like, oh, that's me about right now. Jesus knew what it was like to be thirsty. We just read just a few moments ago. Jesus knew what it was like to be lonely. We certainly can understand from reading what we've read last week and this week that Jesus understood what it was like to be in pain. All of those things happened and all of that was leading up to John declaring this happened. He died. He died. It should mark us. It should change us. Because without the death, there is no life. We see this in, throughout Scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, 3, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to Scriptures. 1 Peter 3, 18, Christ died for sins once for all. Without His death, there is no life. This happened. So two things that I would suggest, knowing that this happened, that Jesus died, two ways in particular that it should affect us. Number one, it should humble us. It should humble us. It should cause us to more fully grasp the significance of our sin. Not just others' sin, our sin. To know that Jesus died in my place, in your place. It should cause great humility. It also should cause an overwhelming appreciation for his gift for his sacrifice. Jesus didn't just be born to a virgin and grow up in poverty, though that would be amazing for God to do that for us. Jesus didn't come and just teach us great things and show us the Father though that's great. Jesus didn't just suffer on our behalf. Take lashings that he didn't deserve, though that would be significant. This happened. He died. He died. So that you can live so that you can have your sins forgiven. He's worthy, amen? amen? Worthy of our worship, worthy of our gratitude, worthy of our lives. As Paul comes to lead us in two closing songs, first song that Paul's gonna lead us in is called Jesus Paid It All. Paid what? It all. Isn't that good news? When Jesus said, Tadalastai, paid in full. He paid it all. Does that mean this? Yes. Does it mean that? Yes. Paid it, paid it all. And it wasn't his debt. It was mine. 
is yours. But Jesus paid it all. And then there's a phrase in the song, all to him I owe, right? So there's this humility mixed with great appreciation, surrender, saying, (laughs) you bought my life, it's yours. I don't know how God is leading you to respond to today's word. but I trust that he is. Maybe you just need to be comforted and encouraged to know that God knows the end from the beginning. Maybe you you just need another reminder. Maybe you need just to know that without his death there is no life and to give him yours today. And so if you're able, I'm gonna invite you to stand as we worship the Lord this morning. And would you just let God do whatever God needs to do? And would you respond however God leads you to respond?